Welcome to Babblecom 5. This is episode 4 of season 5 of Babylon 5, A View from the Gallery. A probe in hyperspace is taken out violently in the opening moments by ships of uncertain design. Lockley is woken up by this news, but it seems they were anticipating this attack. The game have warned the station about a scout fleet assessing likely targets for invasion, and as Lockley tells C&C, for likely, read soft and vulnerable. So they have to win this engagement to change their view of the sector. She tells Corwin to prepare a life pod for Delenn and Sheridan in case things go south, but he says they wouldn't leave. She'll speak to them, and if necessary, knock them out and put them on it. She orders the station to red alert and Star Furies and Thunderbolts launch out. A pair of maintenance technicians notice the third red alert that month, and as they close up a panel, they wonder out loud whether anyone thinks about who fixes the stuff that keeps getting broken. Lockley tries to talk Sheridan around on the life pulse front and may have succeeded. It seems the White Stars are out on missions, so the station is on its own. They pass the maintenance techs, with the little guy noting that he likes Sheridan because he doesn't want to leave, he wants to be in the trenches. Big guy is Bo. He recalls seeing Sheridan chase a guy down who had hurt Delenn and put him down for three days, likely referring to the events of Ceremonies of Light and Dark in the middle of Season 3. He thinks anyone else would have called security to do it, to do it for them. The little guy affirms that it's true love, which you don't often see. Both agree he's a good man. The interplay between the two is quietly hilarious as they wonder what one of the tools they use actually does. Spoo is apparently going for 10 credits an ounce. However, having done a sandwich shop, Bo pronounces that he is not a fan of the Centauri favourite. Whatever it is, it clearly doesn't taste like chicken to him. Not that his partner said it did. Lunch is cut short as maintenance are called to Med Lab and the Observation Dome, and the station moves to full red alert with the scouts on approach. Bo heads to Med Lab, where Franklin is prepping his people to clear out Med Labs for wounded and making sure stocks of blood are available for use. He tells Bo they can't get non-standard atmospheres up as an option on the console, when Bo asks him if he's concerned about treating the other side. Franklin pauses a moment, and agrees it's not always easy playing by rules when others aren't. He tells him he was expected to go career military because that was his family's way, yet he didn't. His father was shot down during the Dilgar War, and when he was finally freed, it was the alien doctor that walked him out of the base having kept him alive. He hopes that someone will do the same for him. And at that point, he chose to break away from the family norm and become a doctor. Bo understands, and asks what happened to the doctor that helped his father. He was killed by his own troops as a traitor. In scene C, the secondary controls for the defence grid are offline, which is horribly bad timing as three enemy scouts choose that moment to jump in. They smash through the furies on the gate and head to the station trying to scan it to be able to compromise its systems. Lockley doesn't want any of them getting back to the main fleet, and the station defenders start to have more joy, knocking out two of the three ships. The third breaks off and starts heading back to the gate, outpacing its pursuers. The tech brings the secondary systems online in the nick of time, allowing Corwin to use long-range defence grid fire to tag the enemy ship and stop its escape. It turns out the system had a bug of the organic variety. One of Londo's little friends, perhaps. Lockley notes that they are in deep they are deep in it, and this was just the scouting group. She needs to speak to the ambassadors and Mr Garibaldi. The technicians reunite on the promenade as Bo is conducting repairs. His friend notes that if he wanted someone watching his back in a fight, it's Lockley. He clearly likes her style. Bo is less sure about her because, because there are rumours that she was on Clark's side in the Civil War. Apparently his partner doesn't pay attention to rumours, of which there are many, about Ivanova's departure too. Heartbroken over Marcus, wanting a promotion. He thinks it's just a military life, people come, people go. Bo wonders why he asked about him about rumours if he doesn't think you should listen to them. He says he likes to keep informed. The lift to take them to Brown Sector stops in blue, and Lockley and Garibaldi board, Lockley chewing Garibaldi out for not having asked the game about the hacking capabilities of the enemy. Her attitude is understandable given an entire fleet is bearing down on them, but Garibaldi quietly thinks there are other reasons for her personal survival odds being lower than average at the moment. As they work on water seepage issues in Brown Sector, Bo's partner asks a very sensible question. If there's an enemy fleet coming in, why not just shut down the jump gate? To which Bo responds that to do so safely would take a couple of days, to restart it would take a few days more. Why? 
because of the sheer amount of power in the gate. Rush the process and it'll be boom today. In any case, wouldn't you want to be able to get out if you still needed to? Then they're called to the sanctuary to help prep it for a religious ceremony. As they leave the repaired access terminal, and it comes back online with Lockley announcing the first wave of enemy ships com is coming through the gate. The external shot suggests the fleet includes two capital ships at least. Bo's partner, now identified as Mac as he calls into maintenance, tells them they're finished and going on break. From the sanctuary they can see weapons fire and ships going up as the battle rages silently outside. Bo notes that a red explosion is an earth ship because of its oxygen atmosphere. The green destinations suggest enemy ships are using a different atmospheric mix. Mac expresses surprise that he knows this, but apparently one of the more down-to-earth pilots was telling him about it the other day. As the red explosion blossoms, Bo crosses himself. He says he isn't religious, it's just a mark of respect because those pilots, maybe the one he spoke to too, are out there fighting for them. And now one's passed, and everything they would ever have been has gone with them. Just then, they see a jump point opening, and a white star enters the fray earlier than expected, but just one. Mac thinks it resembles a plucked chicken, but before that debate can continue, they notice a breaching pod and all personnel are ordered to take shelter. Unfortunately, their life doesn't make it, the lift doesn't make it far, and as Bo punches in a manual override, they open the door to a firefight between a security team led by Zack and a group of red armoured and helmeted invaders. As they watch fire whiz past, appropriately coloured, coded red and green, Bo ultimately has to defend himself, and Mac follows suit, grabbing a dropped rifle and hitting one of the aliens. Zack tells them to get out, and lays down covering fire for them as they crawl out of the kill zone. As they get back to their feet, they come across Byron's telepaths, lost in contemplation of an alien's helmet. Byron explains to them that there is a burst of energy on death that lingers on the body's possessions, that they can get a read to get a sense of the person, their hopes, their fears. Byron assures them that they are safe despite the proximity of the fighting, and the group proves the point by exerting a telepathic mind lock on an alien who arrives on their doorstep. He lowers his weapon, turns, and walks away. Byron notes dryly that while they were born into a hateful world, they do have the ability to defend themselves. As an explosion rocks the station and Mac becomes concerned about a hull breach, Bo asserts his belief in the skills of their pilots and wishes he was out there with them. Byron, a gleam in his eye, asks him if it matters to him that he be with them. Bo meets his gaze and says, yes, it matters. Mac is perturbed. Byron's eyes close and suddenly Bo is at the controls of a star fury, dancing in space around the station as green and red explosions appear in space. Then he's back, with Mac keen to move on, and he exchanges a nod with Byron as they go. In a shelter, Londo and Jakar are with others trying to avoid the conflict. Whilst Londo wonders what he's ever done to the universe, the obvious aside, Jakar is calm and notes that the Centauri once bombed their major cities 31 hours a day to try and quell an uprising when he was a child. This style of life is not unusual to him as a result. He asks Mulari where he grew up, but he says he was never a child. There was always honour and duty to attend to. This explains a great deal for Jakar. He was able to leave his shelters and grow up, where Londo carries his with him and only grew old, not up. Londo resolves to go and check on the situation outside and Jakar agrees. Londo asks if he's worried he won't come back, to which he responds no, he's worried he will. Mac wonders how long they've been married, as Lockley announces the second wave is coming in. The battle is not going well, and a damaged enemy fighter smashes into the station, rupturing the outer hull. As maintenance bots move in, Mac and Bo are called to help fight internal fires from the breach. They don't make it, as Sheridan and Glenn are debating in the corridor as to whether she should get in a life pod. Sheridan puts his foot down and orders Mac and Bo to escort her because security staff can't be spared at this point. The couple embrace before they part as Mac and Bo try not to look on, then assume their escort role. However, just as they reach the docking bay, Delenn needs to ask a couple of questions. First, she asks for their names, which surprises Mac. As they introduce themselves and explain what they do, she describes them as worker cast, and Mac says yes, they're about as worker cast as it gets. Then she has a second question. What would happen if the life pod controls were smashed after launch? Bo considers and says it would smash into Epsilon 3. Mac says it might explode. Glenn says that as time is circular, while she isn't a prophetess, 
she can assure them that this will happen and has therefore already happened, so the life pod is not safe for her to enter. She will not leave the place they call home when she has a chance to help save it. Bo calls out to her as she starts to leave, in a statement that is half question that she really does love Sheridan, and she smiles back at him, proof enough for him and Mac. Then the station rocks again, but Mac doesn't think it's a hit. They move a crate aside and look out an external viewport, as Mac triumphantly declares the cavalry has arrived. And now the White Stars are declared to be angelic, rather than resembling plucked chickens, as they take the fight to the enemy in numbers. Bo says it's all so much bigger than them, but he figures if Londo, Jakar and all the others can handle it, then they can too. Max says that he was told growing up that life only gives you what you can carry on your shoulders. Bo says that maybe to be around here, you just need to grow wider ones. As the space battle resolves itself, Mac and Bo note that the big shots get all the glory, but they're left with all the mess to sort out. Blown airlocks, hull ruptures, floating debris. Then they stop as they see Franklin checking rows of bodies on the floor for life before covering up their faces having closed their eyes. Bo, grim-faced, says maybe not all the mess. Outside the station, worker furies are using their manipulators to gather wreckage. Corrin reports no enemy ships got out to report in, so Lockley considers job done and hopefully they'll move on to the next sector. Command and control is pretty wrecked, and with Mac and Bo on hand, Mac pipes up to tell Lockley that he knows she's new here, but she's okay by them. She smiles wildly at him. Finally, Bo and Mac head to lunch, and pass Sheridan and Glenn in a corridor. Glenn smiles and greets them by name, to Sheridan's bemusement. They're left stunned with Mac declaring love, Bo pointing out she's married, and Mac saying they'll work something out. Apparently, Spoo is now up to 15 credits an ounce. I really, really enjoyed this episode, and if you're going to say this is a Lower Deck style episode, well, sure, say away. It doesn't detract from it in any way, quite the opposite, because here the focus is just on two guys doing their day job and shooting the breeze in between times. The brilliance of this episode isn't just in their interaction about life on board a space station being worker cast, it's the little glimpses we see of the big players we're used to seeing outside of being heavily involved their day to day for once. Each of those gives us insight into the characters that we might not have expected or seen before. To further invert things, we never even find out what the protagonists of the episode are called, because they're not really the point. The point is Bo and Mac and their points of view. So let's just run through some of the really interesting encounters they have. Bo and Franklin have a surprisingly in-depth and personal conversation about Franklin's personal history, and Bo's question is a perfectly logical one. Why help the enemy? The answer to which is, if you value all life, then when your enemy is injured, they stop being the enemy and become another patient. What happens after that you can't control, but it's a choice you make as a doctor not to differentiate. Just interesting that for Franklin, the choice to become a doctor was made off the back of his father being injured as an enemy of one side and so becoming a patient. In CNC, Matt could well have saved the entire station. Yes, obviously, pilots and everyone else on the team do too, but if he doesn't do his job under pressure when the secondary systems stay down and the scout gets out to give intelligence to the fleet, in a what-if scenario, that could have been the tipping point that led to the station going boom. Yet, bless him, that may not even cross his mind, and he's more concerned with what his boss might say about the bug having found its way in there in the first place. So we've seen medical and command, then we get discussion around Lockley's history and Ivanova's departure, which are all things the audience have been wondering about this season, and here these two guys are asking those questions too, because you would. What I notice is that in the background to the scene there are a couple of other guys doing something technical. When you look around in episodes you realise there have always been these guys in the background, Remember Grey 17? It's not a new concept at all. This is just where they get their moment in the spotlight. Also terrific to get Bo doing exposition on why the ships blow up in different colours and how difficult it is to shut down and power up a hyperspace gate. We knew from the opening episode of Season 3 that gates blow up very nicely if taxed, which does make you wonder whether Babylon 5 being so close to a gate, relatively speaking, is a great idea. We've just never had an explanation of why you can't just lock the door before now. Obviously, large ships ought to be able to ignore jump gates anyway and jump in solo, so there'd be even less point in shutting down what could be an exit for smaller ships. Security then get featured doing their thing as Mac and Bo accidentally get involved, as do the telepaths. 
Plus, you then get Bo thrown into the middle of space combat, psionically at least. Then we get Jakar and Londo, Shodan and Delen, the power couples. And again, the Jakar Londo exchanges are like a married couple and do give us real insight into their characters from their very different childhoods. You just wouldn't necessarily have expected it in an episode that feels like it would just be comedic in nature, but actually isn't in many ways. And then we have Delenn's lovely interaction with the pair, where she quickly identifies them as worker cast in Minbari terms, which for her is not a pejorative term. She values the worker cast as equals, but as she noted when reforming the Grey Council, they are often the unseen and unheard in society. That exchange is made all the more delightful when she later calls them by their names after the crisis is over. Finally, there's Mac having the courage to speak up to Lockley directly after all they've been through and give her a verbal thumbs up. And her reaction to that is probably the least hard nose we've ever seen her to this point, as she'd just been telling Corwin she wanted something fixing faster than he said it was possible to do it. Which is also in contrast to the snarling version of her we saw going up against Garibaldi in the lift earlier in the episode, where she basically threatened to rat him out to Sheridan for not doing his job well enough. It's also interesting to note that Byron brings them under his protection even though they're just normals. Perhaps because he recognises that their societal position makes them put upon in a similar way to how telepaths are used as tools. Mac is clearly a little out of his depth with them, but Bo is clearly the deeper thinker of the two, so he gets the gift from the interaction. We also see his character in Medlab and the Sanctuary. He's the philosopher. Perhaps the most powerful shot of the whole episode for me is Franklin checking the bodies, and towards the end of that shot he appears under a neon Welcome to Babylon 5 sign. It's the arrival area being used for departures, but beyond that irony is the sense that for me, you could show this episode to someone unf unfamiliar with the show and say, this is it, this is what this show is about. There is comedy, there is action, there is emotion, there is love. I also got the feeling that this episode brought us back to classic Babylon 5, not only because it ties back to season three, but because it was more focused on the station and a threat to the station and the people who live on it. Also because the Londo and Jakar exchange is so incredibly far removed from where they were in the first season when we had Londo prepared to kill Jakar because Londo felt powerless. Now they look like an old married couple to someone looking in. And that change, that growth is central to the story of the show. This almost feels to me like one of those episodes that starts the season as a, a recap for those unfamiliar. It gives you a clear look at various aspects of the station and the personnel, what it can face day to day, what motivates the big players, and what the so-called little people think of them. This one has far more value to it than if you're an old hand, uh, if you're an old hand, I think, but it's clever in that it works in every direction in that sense. The quasi-negative elements of this episode for me were the space combat elements. The use of red alerts also irked me, to me because I'm not sure we've ever heard that term used in the context of Babylon 5 before, but I could be wrong. You've heard me comment on the way the FX are handled from season 4 onwards, and maybe it's just my age, but it just seems incredibly chaotic. There were just furies everywhere, constantly thrusting with incredibly bright exhaust, big green explosions, all just a bit bonkers. It was good to see the work of furies again towards the end. Now, perhaps the biggest issue I have and I'd have to go back to watch it again perhaps, is that the station takes a big hit from an enemy ship smacking into it with a big eruption of atmosphere and I actually thought at the end that that section wasn't spinning. Which would be something of an issue for everyone in it, having gone zero G perhaps rather abruptly. There was also no mention of it needing to use thrusters to stay on axis and that was a much bigger hit arguably than the one in the gathering. I can accept it might have happened but we didn't see it. I just think it might have been wiser to have had that ship smash into the spine of the station rather than the main section. Although again, it works in terms of a recap episode to remind the viewer that the station has no shields and is actually quite vulnerable to direct assault. Plus as Bo notes, you've really got to clean up well afterwards. Also, bonus continuity points in this episode for the mention of the White Stars being away from the station because they were guarding the Enfili homeworld in the last episode. That did up the ante for the threat here although one does wonder why the lone white star that jumped in early didn't get primaried by every attacking ship, given it was the most powerful allied ship there. So, space battles aside, a rather lovely reminder of just how human the show can be when it's not dealing with the big galactic stuff. May your shoulders be wide enough for what you carry. On to the second disc. Cheers for now.